Good afternoon and welcome to Mossy Bioservices Steam Sterilizer and Autoclave Qualification Best Practices webinar. Thank you for joining us today. And before I turn it over to our presenters, I would just like to go through a few housekeeping items. On the right side of your screen, you should see a control panel. And within that control panel, there is a question box. That is where you can enter any questions you may have for the panelists. All of those will be answered at the end of the presentation. Also in that box, you will see an area where there are handouts. And please feel free to download that. That is a copy of the presentation that you can um, refer to later. You will also be receiving a recording of this webinar uh, within the next 24 to 48 hours. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to our presenter, Kevin, and he is going to start with the presentation. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for that. And uh, welcome everybody to uh, Massey's uh, next webinar in our series of webinars. Uh, again, we're doing steam sterilization and autoclave qualification. You can find all of our webinar series at Massey.com on the website, and I believe it also lives on uh, YouTube. Um, I'm very excited to be joined today by two of Massey's most experienced validation uh, experts uh, covering both coasts of the country. Um, I'm Kevin Eskevich, a Validation Business Development Manager for Massey Bioservices. I work out of our Hatfield, Pennsylvania Validation Office, and uh, I will let my fellow panelists introduce themselves. Well, I'll start it up. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tuan Nguyen and I'm Massey's California Branch Validation Manager. Um, I have six years of a wide variety of experience in validation. I've been at Massey for three years, and my focus here has been with autoclaves, computer systems, and controlled temperature unit validations. Hi, everyone. I'm Sylvan Polk. I'm the Director of Validation for the Pennsylvania office uh, in Hatfield, PA, so I work together with Kevin there. And I've been with Massey now almost 10 years, and I'm uh, excited for the webinar. Excellent. And uh, we'll jump right into our first poll. Okay, so the first poll question is which type of sterilization method do you use most frequently? So we'll give the audience a moment to answer. And we're just going to wait another moment. Looks like people are still answering. Okay. So, Kevin, it looks like, I'm going to share the answers here. It looks like overwhelmingly 100% new steam. Well, that's good news because we are going to focus primarily today on steam sterilization. Um, thank you. So uh, I'm going to pass uh, this slide on to uh, to Juan to start. Um, can you take us through what is sterilization? Yep. Thank you, Kevin. So um, what is sterilization? Um, by definition, it's a process that removes, kills, or deactivates microorganisms. Um, basically, sterility is defined by the absence of microorganisms. Um, there are six types of sterilizations that we're going to overview. Um, first is steam sterilization, which is the focus of our discussion. And it looks like everyone is looking into steam sterilization or involved with steam sterilization. So that's good that um, we're going to be focusing on that. Um, steam sterilization is exposure to steam under temperature or under pressure. Um, it's basically moist heat and temperatures are typically between 121.1 and 140 degrees Celsius for a period of time. Um, it typically requires less exposure time than dry heat, which we'll discuss in the later bullet. Um, steam sterilization focuses on time, temperature, and pressure. And the three most common cycles used are vacuum, gravity, and uh, liquid cycles. Um, our next point is ethylene oxide sterilization. Um, ethylene oxide sterilization is a chemical low temperature um, sterilization process, which is typically between 37 to 63, uh, 63 degrees Celsius, that uses ethylene oxide exposure. Um, 
Um, ethylene oxide is flammable and toxic, and it also requires a longer exposure time. Um, typically, they run around at minimum 12 hours just because of the danger that it exposes to um, us as humans. Um, it is mainly used for products that cannot withstand the heat of typical autoclave sterilization, such as plastic, and can penetrate through uh, breathable packaging and final products. So it's good to use with such things as medical device. Um, the four typical variables for ETO sterilization is gas concentrations, humidity, temperature, and time. Um, the next sterilization process we're going to go through is gamma. Uh, gamma uses ionizing gamma ray radiation, which has very high penetration. Um, energy of gamma ray disrupts the path pathogens that causes uh, uh, contamination. Um, it's most commonly used in food industries and many things such as spices and meats. Um, next, we're going to go into vapor hydrogen peroxide or VHP. It's another type of chemical sterilization process that uses vaporized hydrogen peroxide. Um, it has a much shorter exposure time than ethylene oxide, and it fills basically the chamber and sterilizes all exposed devices that uh, are exposed to VHP. Um, next, we're going to go into dry heat. Um, dry heat is much like steam. Um, ex exposed to heated air around 160 to 190 degrees Celsius. Um, depending on what temperature you use, it may require more um, exposure time against steam. Um, this process is basically sterilizing using an oven and relies on time and temperature and must only be used on items that are damaged by or are impenetrable to moist heat. Or steam. Um, our last sterilization process that we'll be going through is filtration. Um, filtrations for fluids that would be damaged are affected by um, other sterilization methods. Um, sterility is achieved by using a 0.2 micron filter, um, and this method is most commonly used in pharma and biologics processing. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Stilvin to get on to the next point. Well, thank you, Tuan. So sterilization versus sanitization or decontamination, um, just a clarify and provide the, you know, explain the differences in the terms there. Uh, sterilization is a, you know, is a um, much uh, more robust or much more uh, a stronger process in terms of what it's accomplishing. It's uh, it's more defined. Um, to talk about, we're going to talk a lot about sterilization, so I'll actually focus first on decontamination and what that means. So decontamination is the process of removing or neutralizing contaminants. Um, that's uh, consists of removal by cleaning or a chemical means um, and or an in inactivation method, which is uh, can be done chemically or via sterilization. So you're effectively achieving decontamination uh, for the inactivation part of it when, you do, when, when you're performing sterilization. What uh, constitutes an effective decontamination process is determined by the type of material and the contaminant. So really, it, it depends on what you're working with, uh, how you would approach that. Uh, and just to provide an example, you know, if you're if you're trying to decontaminate something that's uh, that, that has radioactive contamination, that's going to be a much different uh, process than uh, for removing a chemical or, or a biohazardous uh, contaminant. Uh, sanitization is an interesting term because it actually does have some criteria around it, uh, as does disinfectant or disinfection, which we don't have up there. Um, it's important to know that sanitization isn't really guided by any standards. So, uh, it doesn't really have a, a criteria associated with it, um, meaning that when you buy something that claim, makes a claim as a sanitizer, uh, if it's not also a disinfectant, um, it does not have approved claims against effectiveness on viruses. So comparing those terms to sterilization, sterilization is, is, uh, is a, by definition, is the removal or absence of microorganisms and um, we'll actually talk a bit more you know about the qualitative quantitative data around that as we as we proceed excellent thank you guys it's a great lead in to our next slide which is lethality and obviously this is our ultimate goal of sterilization is to kill the microorganisms and remove any bio burden from the product that's going out uh sylvan can you take us through this uh this equation for f sub zero certainly um, so yeah, this is where we actually quantify sterilization. And in order to do that, we actually have a, a formula that's used. 
Uh, there is a lethality measurement that's used. Uh, the three factors in steam sterilization are temperature, time, and organism resistance. Uh, lethality can be measured using ver uh, corresponding variables. So you have F, D, and Z. And um, before I actually provide a little bit of explanation on those, uh, it's worth mentioning that most data logging systems that are out there that are designed for uh, sterilization applications will actually include the ability to process that calculation, which is a lot easier than using the formula over there on the right. Uh, so F sub zero, the F value is the time at a specific temperature uh, delivered to the material, the container product inside the autoclave. So this is actually measured via accumulation uh, such that, you know, if you have one uh, accumulated F sub zero, that's an equivalence to one minute of saturated steam exposure at 121.1 degrees Celsius. So it basically gives you a benchmark on, on the uh, sterilization conditions that you're providing. So, it, and it basically increases from there. Two uh, accumulated F sub zeros is equivalent to two minutes of saturated steam exposure, et cetera. Your D value is your time in minutes to inactivate one log of a challenged microorganism at a given temperature. So it's expressed as D and then a subscript of 121, let's say. Uh, and when you're using you know, bioindicators as part of the sterilizer study, uh, bioindicators are pre-populated, uh, either spore strips or liquid ampules. They will have a published D value specific to the sterilization type that they're going to be used for. Uh, a different organism is gonna have a different amount of resistance to the sterilization method that you're using. Uh, and to provide an example, your uh, D value at 121 for an organism such as a uh, commonly used organism uh, in, in BIs, uh, Geobacillus stereothermophilus, uh, is 1.5 to 2.5 minutes. The Z value is the number of temperature change in degrees necessary to change the D value by a factor of 10. So um, though those are your variables. Uh, going on to the a couple of other things that are in here, your log reduction. Uh, we're measuring effective sterilization or effective kill rate here. So our target is a six log reduction. That's our target to make a sterility claim. Each log reduction is a reduction by a factor of 10. So if you're starting with 10 uh, colony forming units or viable organisms, you would expect to have one remaining after a one log reduction. So an easier way to think of that would be that you're basically reducing that microbial population by 90%. So when you're talking about a six log reduction, you're basically left with less one or less uh, per million. And your sterility uh, assurance level and overkill approach, uh, again, it's 10 to the negative six. Uh, same thing as a six log reduction, just a different way of expressing that term. That is the accepted sterility uh, level based on USP chapter 1211. It basically means that less than one in a million uh, microbial uh, uh, organisms would survive. Um, and that's, you know, again, colony forming units, a viable microorganism, you're basically reducing that population down from the starting point of a million down to less than one. Excellent. Thank Thanks, you. Kevin. And Tuan, can you take us how we how do we test for lethality in sterilizers? Yep. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Sylvan, for that overview of the measurements. Um, first, we'll go over the BIs, uh, basically strips versus ampules. Um, at this point where we're performing testing, we're getting into the microbiology aspect of the validation. Um, so I guess just as an overview, spore strips are biological indicators that are packaged in the pouch made of glassine, um, which is basically a paper that has resistance to moisture and air at ambient temperatures and pressures, whereas ampules are small self-contained vials that are sealed. Um, they have a score mark around the neck so that the sealed top can be snapped off by hand. Um, so when do you use strips and when do you use ampules? Um, strips are typically used in dry heat, steam, um, ethylene oxide, and hydrogen peroxide to minimize moisture intact of the strip. As if you want to use a strip in a liquid cycle, you don't want to um, basically compromise the strip through a liquid cycle. Whereas ampules are more commonly used for um, the liquid cycles. Um, getting to the next point, positive and controls are important in the sterilization phase as the positive and negative controls confirm the accuracy and correctness that the biological indicators used aren't compromised. Um, much like post-verifying sensors that you use for temperature humidity, 
um, you're wearing something that didn't you're wearing something that uh, didn't go wrong during the qualification phase of your project. As still been um, indicated earlier, um, usually all biological indicators have instructions on medium and conditions to use for the test of the BIs for the post-exposure sterilization process. Um, as an example, for testing of mesolapse biological indicators, TRIPS, um, usually triptic soy broth is used as the media with a purple pH indicator just to see if um, it's negative or positive. And it's typically incubated in a 60 degree um, incubator for 24 hours to see if the BI is tested negative or positive. Excellent. Moving along, uh, Sylvan, can you take us through uh, GMP versus non-GMP sterilization? Yes. So there are different sterilizer types for different applications, um, obviously different sizes as well. Uh, you're, when you're talking about commercial or production autoclaves, they provide a very large chamber typically, and they're suited for large load items or volumes. When you're doing, you know, large volume production, you just makes sense. You're going to use a much larger autoclave. Uh, a bench top uh, is the uh, other end of the spectrum where you have something that's very small, um, suitable for smaller load items or volumes. Uh, fundamentally, they still operate in the same manner, but you'll typically see more advanced controls and uh, more instrumentation on a larger unit. Um, a decontamination autoclave. So really, it's it's just the purpose or the application that you're using the autoclave for. Uh, when you're decontaminating, you're actually inactivating uh, the bio burden in medical or biological ways to make it safe for disposal. So um, it's a uh, making sure that you don't have anything viable uh, before you discard uh, that material. Uh, gravity feed and vacuum. So this describes the mechanical difference between certain autoclaves. Uh, the difference is that gravity, a gravity autoclave will use the positive pressure of incoming steam to replace all of the air in the chamber uh, and in and around the load items. So you can think of it as if you if you picture the chamber, you know, the inside chamber, a picture a cylindrical chamber of the autoclave with a drain pipe down at the bottom. As the as the steam is being brought into the chamber, the uh, air has a higher density uh, than the incoming steam, and it will actually flow down and toward that drain and out through the drain as the steam is is and entering the chamber and replaces the air. Uh, and and that's done by opening the drain valve to allow the air to escape. Uh, the difference in a vacuum autoclave is that it actually is equipped with a vacuum pump. So instead of just relying on the steam to come in and using positive pressure to, to displace the air, you actually have a vacuum pump that's pulling the air out. So you have a push-pull effect where you're uh, pulling vacuum and then alternating, bringing the steam in under positive pressure. And that's actually a much more effective method in achieving complete air removal and steam penetration throughout the load. You do not want air to be in that chamber uh, while you are trying to sterilize. Uh, on the last part there, we have steam control. So um, proportional integral derivative or PID control versus needle valves and pulse. This is again, just a sort of a mechanical difference in, in the type of uh, autoclave. You can control steam injection through instrument feedback and a PID controller does that. It basically will look at, um, it provides a higher degree of control and accuracy because it's looking at feedback from installed pressure and temperature sensors and it can precisely control the steam flow into and out of the chamber's jacket and also the chamber where you're actually you have your material that you're sterilizing. So autoclaves are actually dual walled and the jacket is also fed steam to maintain temperature. Um, when you're talking about a needle valve, that's typically manually set um, and it doesn't give you that kind of uh, fine tune and ability to modulate those valves. So it's uh, preferable to have a PID control that uses instruments to control the cycle more precisely. Excellent, thank you. And, uh, and now Thuan's going to take us through some of the guidance and regulations for the industry out there for sterilization. So, some of many. Yeah, so we're just listing a few that are basically widely used in our industry. I know that out there, if you look at guidances and regulations, there's a ton that you can find. But a lot of these ones that we reference are basically um, guidances and standards that FDA inspectors and EU inspectors are trained through for when they go into audits. 
Um, so the first one is the PDA Tech Report 1, which is validation of moist heat sterilization process, cycle design, development, qualification, and ongoing control, um, which what this uh, basically tech report provides is an introductory overview of what is sterilization and how to validate a sterilizer or autoclave as well as requirements to validating an autoclave. Um, so this provides a well-defined, um, this is a well-defined document that provides you all the information you need on how to validate a steam, or steam autoclave. Um, the next one is PDA Tech Report 48. Um, this provides an engineering perspective on sterilizing with development of a user requirement spec or user S that was created from low types, sterilizer designs, installation cycle development, facilities considerations that you may need to consider when you're um, looking to install an autoclave, and basically how to maintain the validated state of the sterilizer after you have initially qualified it. Um, basically, this tech report gives you a life cycle approach of the sterilizer system, so from beginning to end, and this was a follow-up to basically uh, tech report number one. Um, the next one that we're going to get into is ISO 11135. Um, this um, EU standard is uh, basically a standard that gives you requirements and guidance on how to use sterilization, sterilization using ethylene oxide. So it basically gives you all the requirements for um, both industry and healthcare facility settings, and it gives you um, basically guidance on what are the differences as well as what's the similarities between the two settings. Um, the last point we're we'll going on this slide is USP 1211. Um, this one provides you guidances and information on the type of sterilization missions, sterilization methods we uh, mentioned earlier on the second slide and provides guidance on how to perform validations of each. So it gives you an overview of all the different methods and what you need to know. Um, for the next one, we're going to go through BSEN 285, which is also a European standard. And it specifies guidances and specifications for commercial size large sterilizers, primarily used in healthcare for the sterilization of medical devices and all their different types of accessories. Um, this specifically um, applies to sterilizers with at least 60 liters of volume, so a little bit bigger in size. And it is also widely used as guidance for steam quality testing, which we'll get over, um, which we'll overview later on in a later slide. Um, the next one, ISO 17665, um, it's similar to PDA number one and PDA number 48, those tech reports, but this one provides requirements for um, basically the EU side. So if you're following regulations on the EU side. And then lastly, we're going through the Health Technical Memorandum 0101. Um, again, this provides you with um, basically guidelines on managing and the con contamination of medical devices um, used for steam sterilizer. So again, there's a lot of different guidances and standards out there, but I know that these ones are the most widely looked at and used in terms of what um, companies and what auditors look at. So all these provide great guidance, whether you're on the US side or whether you're on the European side. Excellent, thank you, Tawan. Yeah, and during my research for this webinar, I, I found that the EU and US have different approaches and the EU uh, does widespread acceptance of the standard of 121C at 15 minute cycles. And the US allows more cycle variability, uh, but really relies on the SAL and BIs to prove lethality. Uh, next slide, we're getting into tools of the trade. So this is what we use to test for lethality and do the validation. Sylvan, can you take us through the tools of the trade? Uh, certainly. So uh, whenever we're in the validation process uh, for a steam sterilizer, uh, we utilize the data acquisition system or data logging system. There are a few different types. Uh, so the first one and the most popular one, one's been used the longest, would be thermocouples. Uh, those are insulated wires that are brought in, and at the uh, tip of the wire, you actually have your temperature uh, measurement being taken. Uh, in order to use those in a sterilizer, you do have to have a way to get them inside. They actually are connected to the data logger itself. So uh, many, many autoclaves will come with an ingress port or what's also referred to as a validation port, which is basically a, a, a pipe that, you know, is a capped a capped pipe on the side of the chamber that allows you to feed in your, your thermocouples. 
Uh, the important thing there is to make sure that you achieve a good seal. Um, if you are bringing something into that chamber, you can actually infect the, uh, affect the chamber integrity and the chamber does need to be sealed uh, during its vacuum and, and pressurization phases. So uh, when we're bringing uh, using thermocouples to validate a chamber will often, um, or it should be required that you actually do leak testing uh, before and afterwards to make sure you didn't compromise the chamber uh, by bringing the thermocouples in. Steam slicing is uh, necessary also when you're using thermocouples. Um, and I'll explain in a minute why that is. Um, the other type of equipment that we also use are wireless sensors. So there's a convenience that they do not need to be brought in through that port. And you can also argue that you don't need to be as concerned about performing leak tests because you're not really messing with the chamber integrity. Um, the potential downside to wireless systems is that they're battery powered uh, and you're putting them inside a pretty harsh environment. So if you don't have that data logger properly, um, you know, properly closed up, sealed up, et cetera, if it's not reassembled properly and, and steam gets inside, that data logger is probably gone. Uh, it will probably destroy it. But that, there are many products out there that are made to withstand that condition. And the ones pictured there are data trace uh, loggers made by Mesa Labs. Uh, we have used those and they are designed to actually function in that environment and they work well. Um, there's a difference with wireless sensors of RF versus non-RF also. And that, that, that distinction is whether or not that uh, logger uh, sends the data out through a radio uh, signal so that you can actually see your temperature data in real time while the study is running. That can be very beneficial. Um, it's not impossible to use a non-RF logger, but obviously there's an advantage to seeing the data while the cycle is running. Um, especially when you're actually running a sterilization cycle uh, where there's a clock on the system that's actually timing uh, uh, the events. Uh, when you have a, the report coming out of the sterilizer, we'll have time stamped readings. Um, and we'll typically, we'll sync our system up with that sterilizer. So when you can see the data, it's a little better to know what's going on. And the RF provides that capability. Um, and yet into the bottom here of you know, the last bullet, what happens if you don't slice, steam slice your thermocouples? Well, what happens is that there's an insulation layer around that wire and the steam is under pressure in the chamber and it's in gas phase. So it'll move into that insulation and actually travel all the way down that wire, even a 20 foot, 25 foot long thermocouple wire. It'll make it all the way to the other end, which is connected in the uh, onto a PCB board in the data logger. So that moisture comes out as water droplets and you don't want that hitting electronic components. So what we do to prevent that from happening is we actually cut off uh, about a one inch piece of the outer insulation somewhere in, at the far end of the wire, so closer to the data logger. And then the water just basically harmlessly drips out and doesn't end up going inside uh, where it can cause damage. Excellent, thank you for that. And uh, Tuan, take us into our planning phase of the qualification. Great, thanks, Kevin. Um, next, we'll get to the planning phase. So even before we get into the qualification of the autoclave, we wanna make sure we have everything planned before we get into that next phase. So first is steam quality testing. Um, I wanna note that this only applies to uh, commercial size autoclaves or autoclaves that are connected to pure steam generators. If they are tabletop and they do not require a pure steam generator, this is not a requirement. Um, but steam quality is basically used to measure the physical aspects of the steam used for sterilization. Um, this is basically a precursor to performing the autoclave IQ, OQ, PQ. Um, first, the first test during the steam quality testing is the non-contestable uh, non gas test. Um, basically, it's the amount of the steam by volume that is air or other gases that does not contribute to sterility of the load. Um, based on EN285 guidelines, the percentage of non condensable gases in the steam should be less than or equal to 3.5% by volume. Um, basically, you want to make sure that all the steam that's going through your autoclave that sterilizes your equipment is sufficient. So you want to you don't want to have air or other gases be a part of the steam. So this is a test to check that. The next one is superheat testing which is the temperature of the steam above the temperature of saturated steam for a given uh, moisture content. Um, when the temperature and moisture content do not match up, two things can happen. Um, if the moisture content is higher than saturation for the temperature, a wet load occurs and you might not get um, sterility for your equipment or whatever you're sterilizing. Um, on the other hand, when the moisture content is lower than saturation for the temperature, 
Um, this condition is called superheat, which is basically referenced in the name. Um, in superheat, the steam is too dry and the energy content is too high. And when this happens, it may um, basically melt your packaging or may damage your product. Um, the last point for steam quality testing is dryness testing. Um, this basically measures the amount of moisture content in the steam. Um, the amount of moisture content in steam should be less than 5%. Um, if steam doesn't meet requirements per EN 285, um, they may cause wet loads, damaged loads, unsterile loads, BI failures, and even staining or corrosion of your equipment. So you want to make sure that um, you get the steam tested before your autoclave qualification because that may cause errors when you're running your qualification. Um, the next step in the planning phase is the protocol development. If this is the requalification of the autoclave, a lot of the aspects that are already provided based on what the autoclave is capable of doing, what needs to be sterilized, what guidance regulations need to be followed, and what the sterilization approach and qualification is needed is already there. Um, this is more tied to the initial qualification and only the load, known, load items are known. Um, this is the part where we at Massey will go above and beyond to provide a protocol that plans for the unknowns that will come out of the OQ portion of the test and provide the correct industry approach and cycle development efficiency that will be discussed in a later slide. Thank you, Tuan. And that's going to take us into our second poll question. Okay, Kevin, so the second poll question, I'm going to launch that now. Is Which is your preferred toolkit for performing autoclave or steam validation? And we'll give the audience a moment to answer. I've got some people answering, so we'll give another moment. This is a popular question, Kevin, so everybody is still answering. Excellent. There's no wrong answers here. <laughs> All right, so now we're we're going to close the poll and uh, we'll share the answers with the audience. It looks like 53% their preferred toolkit is a wireless or wireless data loggers, 35% steam sliced thermocouples, and 12% say that they're unsure that they haven't done these validations before. Excellent. And that's where Massey can help you out. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, moving on to our next slide. Uh, after the planning, we get into executing the plan, and Sylvan is going to take us through uh, the IOQ portion of this. Yes, thank you. Um, so when we're executing the installation and operational qualification, there's a few things we definitely want to make sure we consider. Uh, we want to make sure that our test documents have predefined acceptance criteria. Um, it's kind of a given, but the idea is, you know, before you're approaching the testing, you should have uh, a, a, an approved uh, acceptance criteria in place, you know, something that's agreed upon what, what your target is uh, in terms of, uh, you know, your test results, uh, what, what constitutes a pass versus a fail result. Uh, very important, uh, absolutely essential that you have your uh, critical instruments calibrated on that autoclave. So your uh, we talked before about the PID, uh, you know, loop control or controller having a PID. You know, you have to make sure that the, um, you know, that the sensors that are actually running that machine are, are functioning properly, that they're accurate, and also, of course, the sensor that's providing the output. Um, your your sterilizer is going to have a, a a tape or a report that it prints out post cycle or during the cycle, and uh, the sensor that captures those measurements. Uh, they need to be accurate. That becomes your record, so they have to be calibrated. Uh, and the calibration should be done with a NIST traceable standard also. Uh, on the documentation side, you know, there's a lot of things. Once you, uh, you know, validation isn't really kind of a once and done thing. There's an important, uh, it's very important that you have a maintenance plan set up. If that equipment is not maintained, it's not going to continue to function reliably. Uh, there should be a spare parts list. You should have a uh, identification specific to the unit. Sometimes a serial number is used, but possibly another asset ID or something like that as well. All that stuff should be captured in the qualification. 
uh, testing for alarms, uh, very important. Um, there are safeties and interlocks on a sterilizer. It's potentially hazardous piece of equipment if it's not operated correctly. Um, so making sure that those alarms are working properly is very important. Making sure that they're tested safely is also important. Um, not defeating interlocks, et cetera, um, or creating an unsafe condition, but making sure that those alarms are tested is important. Uh, making sure that we do a vacuum leak test as well. Make sure that test functions properly and also to show that we have good chamber integrity. Um, air removal testing, uh, Bowie Dick, that's to make sure that this, the autoclave is, is properly and fully removing the air and replacing it with steam. If you do not have that, you will not have effective sterilization. So that's an important thing to check. And then performing the empty chamber mapping, uh, we basically, we have a geometric arrangement. We place our probes inside the chamber. And what we're looking for is to see that our drain probe temperature is maintained uh, at the set point that that probe in the sterilizer is actually what controls the cycle. So it's very important that it is uh, properly maintained, you know, that it's reading correctly. Uh, we will always place a data logger or sensor at that location. That's considered a critical location. And then also with the other sensors that we have spread throughout the chamber, we're going to, at the um, completion of the study, we're going to evaluate that data and we're going to look at where our hottest and coldest locations are, uh, especially the coldest location, because that's actually going to be worst case uh, for any product or material that's put in there. And then the last piece here is your exhaust air filter sterilization. So there, there's a filter integrity testing and also making sure that that filter is uh, appropriate and functioning properly because when the chamber uh, repressurizes at the end of the cycle, it's actually pulling in outside air. And if it's not passed through a sterile filter, you're gonna recontaminate that chamber and the product inside right after the cycle is done. And you don't want that. All right, thank you for that. Jumping ahead here. And Tuan, can you uh, take us into the importance of cycle development? Yes, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Sylvan, for the overview of the IO. Um, next, I'm going to go into cycle development um, during the cycle development phase. Um, basically, um, we basically gather information so that we need to have uh, challenge loads for the PQ. So first, we'll perform an empty chamber mapping that places sensors throughout the autoclave in an envelope plane that captures the hot and cold spots of the chamber, as Sylvan discussed. Um, with this information, if it's not a fixed load, the load items are then tested to analyze which load items are hardest to heat based on their accumulated uh, lethality after equilibration of the sensors in the exposure phase. Um, with this determination, determination and the information we have from the empty chamber mapping, the load items that are hardest to heat are then placed in the cold spot to verify if an increased or reduced sterilization time is needed for the PQ step with BI implementation, which Sylvan will elaborate on in the next slide. But um, I know that um, this method goes above and beyond and has helped numerous of our customers increase their manufacturing efficiency dramatically um, when they allow us to cycle development for them. As in some cases, we've seen sterilization times reduce to four hours from eight hours based on the data analysis. So um, cycle development is very important because it does increase um, efficiency and um, it, it helps with the loss of time, so. Excellent. Thank you, Tuan. Moving into uh, our last slide here, actually executing the plan. Sylvan's going to take us through the performance qualification. Yes. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Tuan. So the PQ is basically using all, all that information that we previously captured, and now we're actually mapping with the load and the contents in the chamber. Uh, again, we want to make sure we have predefined acceptance criteria. Uh, we should use the data that was earlier, that was generated earlier to understand, um, you know, how we want to set that load up. Um, and also, it's really important, too, to make sure that we're uh, adhering to the applicable uh, regulations and guidance, uh, you know, where, where depending on where this company is located or what, you know, market uh, they're servicing, they want to make sure that their, that their approach is, is going to meet those requirements. Uh, when we map uh, during the PQ, we have a load in place in the chamber. Um, it's still very important that that drain probe temperature is maintained. That is a, a criteria actually that the EU has, uh, they have an equilibration criteria as well. So um, that drain probe is always a critical location. We have to have data from that location and it needs to um, be maintained at that temperature. Um, and then along with other, the other probes that are positioned that are actually inside the load. Um, 
and this is, you know, these are all, these are critical metrics to make sure that the run is passing. Uh, hardest to heat load items should be challenged at the coolest location in the chamber. That basically establishes a worst case approach. Uh, you're making sure that even your uh, hardest to heat item in that coolest location is still, uh, you're achieving, comfortably achieving sterility there. Um, very important that that approach is taken um, to make sure that everything, all the entire load, all parts of it are, are st sterilized. And then the last bullet here talks about liquid cycles and using a load probe. Um, basically, the difference here is that a sterilizer has a secondary probe or additional probe, which is inside the chamber that can be placed into liquid. And it will, it will operate differently than a regular, let's say a dry goods cycle will actually control the ta uh, chamber temperature using the drain probe. With a liquid cycle, the chamber is actually controlled using the load probe because of the additional time that's needed for liquid to come up to temperature. Um, it's actually important to have a probe in place so that you can see exactly when that happens. So the uh, liquid cycles should use a load probe. An alternative method, um, and I've, I've seen this done before, is to actually use data logging system to determine how much additional time you need for the liquid. But the load probe is the best way to go about it because you will always have that information. The cycle will not start. Uh, the sterilization phase will not begin, I should say, um, until the actual liquid reaches temperature. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and I'd like to thank my two uh, co-presenters. Uh, this is the end of our webinar today. Uh, we're going to lead into a third poll to find out what the audience would like to find out more about sterilization. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a series of webinars that Massey is putting on, and uh, we're going to ask you for your input on what our next sterilization webinar might look like. Okay, thank you, Kevin. I'll give the audience a few moments to answer this question. All right, so answering. Okay, Kevin, it looks tight. Let's share the results. It looks like 50% um, of the audience would like to see regulatory requirements and industry guidelines covered in more depth, 33% uh, protocol development, and 17% how to choose an IQOQPQ vendor. Excellent. Excellent. And I believe we're going to go into uh, any questions from the audience at this point. Hi, Kevin. I do have a couple of questions from the audience for you guys. Um, the first question I have is how many probes are installed for mapping? I, I'll take that question. Um, that's a great question. It depends. <laughs> so we have a, basically a, a a starting point or a minimum. Um, when we're doing the empty chamber, for example, we want to make sure, I think Tuan actually kind of elaborated on this a little bit before, we want to make sure we're covering all of the inside areas of the chamber. So there's a geometric approach that we'll use, and it's a typically a three-plane approach. So, you know, we're at the top, middle, and the bottom of the chamber, and then typically it's going to be, you know, it, often the chamber is a cylindrical shape. Sometimes they're shaped like a box or a rectangle. But our approach is to get sensors into the four corners at the top, the four corners at the bottom, and then somewhere around the middle. So we typically end up around 15 to 16 sensors, um, making sure that one is always also placed near the drain probe. When you talk about the loaded uh, cycles, you know, where you have material in there, then it really depends on how much load material you have and what you need to actually uh, challenge with, with, a, with a, a temperature sensor. If you have a lot of items that you think are going to be potentially difficult for the steam to access, tubing, et cetera, you'll definitely want to target those areas with probes. So that decision has to be made based on the amount of load material uh, that you're that you're um, testing. And, and I'd like to add uh, to that, Sylvan, the PDA Tech Report 1 does specify that a minimum of 10 uh, thermocouples should be used or five thermocouples per 100 cubic feet of volume. So they do specify, uh, Massey usually uses a 16 minimum in, in most of our validations. 
Yep, yep, thank you, Kevin. Great. Um, the next question is, of all the sterilization methods that exist, which are the most common and why? You want to grab I that one? I can take that one. <laughs> yep. So for sterilization, um, I guess it depends on what industry you're in. I know that for the pharma industry, steam sterilization is most common. Um, if you're looking into medical device or biotech industry and you have finished product or you have a product that are less resistant to heat, then they would use ethylene oxide as their sterilization method. Um, if you're in a dental office or you're in a hospital setting, there's sometimes they use dry heat. So it really much depends on um, what industry you're in. But for the most part, the most common one is um, steam sterilization. Okay, the next question is, how often should benchtop autoclaves be qualified? Is the frequency different for industrial autoclaves? I'll take that one. Um, the answer is really that has to be driven by the usage of that autoclave. Uh, uh, we talked before about GMP versus non-GMP. So if you're operating that benchtop autoclave and you have, it's a it's a GMP application, for example, um, then your, your, your standards are the same. But with respect to how you approach the qualification, uh, you, you still need to qualify that piece of equipment and you also uh, would uh, want to requalify it. Uh, the typical interval is, is annually. Um, of course, that's you know, always a risk-based decision, so it, it can be done more often if that's uh, decided to be beneficial, but the typical interval we see is once a year. And um, yeah, if again, if, if the autoclave is, you know, deemed GMP based on the usage, the type of material that's being uh, sterilized, then uh, you would be the a qualification approach would not really be different, uh, just due to the the size or the type, um, you know, smaller versus large. And, and I would like to add that in general, uh, outside of the annual interview. Uh, interval, sorry, uh, anytime you make a change to the autoclave or if you add a new cycle or, or different loads, uh, you, you want to have that qualified as well. Okay, um, the next question I have says some of the guidance you reference here is from the EU. Is EU guidance relevant if I don't do business in Europe? Hey, everyone. Um, great question. Um, a lot of the US and EU guidances Basically, they may be worded differently, but a lot of them have a lot of the same language, just worded a little bit differently. Um, like Kevin elaborated early on, um, US focuses on lethality and they focus on SIP, whereas EU um, focuses on having items basically um, sterilized at 150 for at least 15 minutes. Um, when you look at these two differences in terms of what the US and the EU looks at, um, the lethality is actually tied to um, how much um, time you sterilize. So um, you might get a sterility of uh, or a lethality of 0.0 or higher when you sterilize the items at 121 for 15 minutes, or you may have less than, but it definitely uh, basically depends on what items you're using to um, your items, the items you're using in your load and um, what um, items you're using for um, for your production runs. Um, if you do want to potentially get into the market of the EU, it, uh, it's also good to follow those um, guidelines as well, but a lot of the guidelines um, basically have similar wording. So um, as long as you can justify um, why what your requirements are and what your acceptance criteria are, then um, there should be no issues with that. I'll jump in on that too a little bit. You know, the, there's there's some advantage to like, even if you don't have to abide by the EU regulations, um, that steam quality testing is uh, very useful information. Um, when you're looking, you know, when you have a sterilization process, knowing that the steam you're bringing into that chamber meets that criteria uh, is really helpful. If it's not meeting that criteria, you might be, you might not be getting the same level of sterilization. You know, might, that could impact lethality. So that particular testing is kind of more EU driven, but we also do see a lot of customers uh, 
wanting to get the steam quality testing done because they recognize the, the value of having that information, even if they're not an EU company. Great. Um, I have one last question from the audience, and it is, I'm transitioning to commercial production. What should I focus on in updating our SOP? Could you repeat the last part of that? I'm not sure if I caught the question. I'm transitioning to commercial production. What should I focus on when updating our SOP, standard operating procedures? Okay. Um, the SOP, you know, by definition is your procedure. It's, you know, it's, it's your, it's, uh, uh, guiding or, you know, uh, providing the, the outline, the rules for your process. So if you're making a change to your process, uh, you should look at your SOP to make sure that it, it properly, uh, it's revised to properly uh, address those changes. Um, if, for instance, bringing a new piece of equipment into a manufacturing process or changing how something is done, um, it's, it's imperative to make sure the SOPs get updated because otherwise you're going to be functioning using a, an incorrect procedure or one that's not uh, a valid or, or appropriate for what you're doing. So absolutely. Um, and making sure that, you know, the, um, you know, all of those changes are properly captured should actually be part of the uh, the change management process. Procedures are, are critical. Um, one thing that uh, you don't want to have happen is that you're, you're audited or somebody comes in, uh, it could be a regulatory agency, and they find that your actual practices don't match your, your written and approved SOPs. That's not good. And I think it, in addition to what Sylvan's saying, uh, I think it's important for, uh, you know, all the biopharma companies out there to have a, a robust uh, quality uh, program and philosophy. Uh, and I think as they move from, uh, you know, R&D into production, uh, that quality piece needs to be, uh, you know, carried over. Um, and I, the way I heard that question was, you know, if we change to GMP and manufacturing, um, and I think you need to address your quality early on in your process and continue to validate that process as you expand it. Okay. That's yeah, all the questions then, uh, I have. To, oh. I, guess, I guess to add uh, Kevin and Sylvan's point, um, I know that Kevin elaborated on going from R&D to commercial production. So at that point, you want to look at the qualification of your autoclave as well. So you want to make sure you can develop a top protocol and potentially cycle develop so that you have param parameters that you'll consistently use for your production runs. So you want to qualify the autoclave that they're tabletop. And if you're dealing with large steam, um, steam autoclaves that do have pure steam generators, you also want to look uh, beforehand at looking at uh, steam quality testing to make sure that the steam that goes to the autoclave is sufficient. So, so give Massey Bioservices a call. <laughs> I'll turn that over to you. That's all the questions that I have from our audience. All right, great. Thank you, Amy. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Hopefully, you got some useful information out of this. The panelists all did a great job. Uh, again, please um, feel free to download the present hand section before uh, join us for our next webinar. Keep an eye out and on our website. Thank you and everyone have a great afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you everyone.